shaman who had to enlighten their tribes people so that they could actually open their eyes and be able to see the ships now this is an old story but i think it actually applies today the rothschild banking cartel the new world order those are columbus's ships and people like yourself and myself are the shaman trying to teach everybody to see them i think that's a very good analogy uh, and uh, i also well it, it, it's more than a very good analogy really because i've started i've got those shivers i've got you know my spine and the hairs on my arms are standing on end and that's not because it's freezing in the northeast but it is just to let you know ne- nevertheless i think that it's it it's gotten to the point now where i think so many people have realized right across the planet but i, I can i can speak i can speak more more clearly from my own experiences on this island I, 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 everywhere you go everywhere you go you just you go out your front door you walk down the street if you live in a city you see pissed off miserable people everywhere you go you know and i'm sure it's like that where you live as well mm. you know, so so few people are happy doing what they're doing they're constantly distracting themselves with technology and all, all the rubbish that they pump out on the mainstream media, it's all distraction. None of it is good for them. And, and it's, uh, how, how often do you see three or four people walking down the street and they're, they're texting on their phone and they've got no idea that they're walking past somebody else who's texting on their phone uh, and they're walking past each other. You know, they, 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 they could be perfect for each other and their eyes never meet because they're texting on their phone or they're looking at their phone, reading a text. It's like, what's going on here? Is anybody actually living in the present moment anymore? People have turned into ships passing each other in the night. In the day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's it's terrible. It's it's like almost like we've become dehuman, uh, uh, subhuman, right? Like like gradually over time we've been genetically modified and influenced and uh, and, and technologically transmogrified and so on and so forth to be less than human. Yes, there's there's no doubt about that. That the, the connection between people. When I was growing up in the northeast here. In the 70s, the connection between people was much greater than it is now. But you, 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 you put it this way, my grandparents did not start locking their doors until the 1980s. Yeah. They didn't. They were just used to walk in and out of the house. They, were, they, they lived in a pit village. They had done their whole lives. It's where they were born. It's where they died. You know, I remember as a child asking them, why, why do you never lock the door? Well, then, if we locked the door, no one would be able to come in. <laughs> oh my god well i suppose now it's a good idea to lock your doors anyway because otherwise police might come in <laughs> yes exactly exactly and evict you from your rightfully paid home <laughs> well this is it yeah. this is it yeah all right well we're gonna take a break ladies and gentlemen we'll be right back michael of benicia is my guest And we're back. Michael of Benicia is my guest. Do you have a website there? Selfrealization.com. Selfrealization. Is it self-realization.com or just yes, one Yes, thank you for correcting me. It's self-realization.com and realization with an S. Ah, okay. And how long has that website been running roughly? Oh, it was launched in August. Oh, okay. So, so, so relatively new there. Yes, it is relatively new, but uh, an awful lot of the material has been taken from my former website, um, freetheplanet.net, which ah. some people might, might have known. And how long had that been going for? Because I want to kind of, um, you know, when you want to understand, um, or, or sorry, sorry, when you want to write a mystery novel, what you do is you start from the end and you work your way backwards. <laughs> <laughs> So can can we start from uh, today and work our way backwards to how this actually this this kind of um, I would say campaign or crusade of yours where did it begin? Um, 
I wouldn't call it a crusade or a campaign, but I understand why you did, because you're right, you don't have the other pieces of the jigsaw. Well, I, 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 declared, my, I, I declared my own sovereignty, and I, I, I said I would, I would live according to my own conscience, and the, that I would have no master, I would obey nobody. I would obey no diktat, no order, no directive, nothing. I would only agree to do something in advance of doing it. And it was difficult, it was difficult, but it, where this started, Vinny, and I wasn't sure if I was going to talk about this, but I think I should because um, I feel like it's the right time. But in three days after 9-11, I met a Bilderberg insider online who was looking for a writer and I was working in in the film industry at the time and I was writing screenplays and she she found me completely by chance and we were both we, we were both looking for someone to have a proper conversation about 9-11 about how how bad it all looked how obvious it was that something was amiss and she confided to me that not only not only did she know that it was going to happen, she knew who did it, who arranged the finance, who organized the people involved, and she had known about it, along with a lot of other people she knew, since around about 98. So the three years preceding 9-11, she said... It was a talking point on in the private clubs, at the, at the places such as on the east coast of the US, where wives of millionaires and billionaires used to go for lunch. It was a talking point that there was going to be a staged event in New York, probably, although that, they didn't say it was definite, but probably in New York, that would bring about great change for the greater good. And when she confronted one of the women that she was having lunch with about this and said, I haven't heard that, where, where are you getting that from? And she says, oh, pretty soon you'll hear about it. And she pressed her on it and she said, look, well, what are you talking about? Staged event. There's going to be something happened, happen, happening probably in New York and a lot of people are going to die, uh, but it will be for the greater good in the long run. The world will become a better place because of it. And she immediately thought of about what Henry Kissinger had said about needing to get rid of the useless eaters by one way or another. And her husband at that time, as well as being a senior politician in the US, he was also an international ambassador and she described him as Henry Kissinger's right-hand man. Now, you can imagine, I've just met this woman online. I, I, I've got no idea whether she's telling me the truth. But I know that something in my heart is telling me that I've got to follow this up. So I start asking questions. And we, we have numerous conversations. And we started communicating um, two or three times a week over a period of months where she confessed to me that she went to her husband knowing that he was very senior in the political and diplomatic realm and knowing that if, 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 if it was going to happen then Kissinger would know about it and Kissinger would have told him. So she confronted her husband and said have you heard about this? And she knew from the look on his face that he had but he didn't say anything. And she basically said, look, I'm horrified by this. I, I think someone should alert the media. If, if you are saying this is actually happening or this is going to happen, then someone needs to warn the people of New York. And at that moment, she told me that she, she, she knew her marriage was over because the look on his face, it just it was a look she'd never seen before. And he said, whatever you do, don't do that. And their marriage hit the skids, as you can imagine. They had children, and he, he, he desperately tried to patch it up with her, and she wasn't sure whether to trust him. So she gave him a chance and agreed to go on a make-or-break holiday 
in Africa. And they went to Kenya. And his attitude changed completely towards her. And she was even starting to wonder if she could trust him again. And maybe she'd misread the way he reacted. And because she was, her attitude was softening, she agreed to allow him to go during their holiday and have a breakfast meeting with another diplomat and agreed to meet him at the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi. And she was sitting there five minutes after he'd said that he was going to be there and she realised he was late for the very first time in their marriage to her, to her recollection and she knew something terrible was about to happen. And then the U.S. Embassy exploded. It was the Nairobi bombing. The two explosions that was blamed on Al-Qaeda. And she immediately knew, well, in that moment, she said a thousand things went through her head in one second. And she woke up um, in the arms of a man who had pulled her from the burning rubble. And she didn't know who he was, but he saved her life. He took her to uh, a hospital, um, which I think was on the outskirts of the city because the city, or all of the city's hospitals were jam-packed. There were so many people injured and killed in these explosions. And most of them either worked in the U.S. Embassy or they were, they were walking past or working near the U.S. Embassy. There were, it was a horrendous sight. The carnage was, was appalling. Um, so she was one of the lucky ones. And he took her to a, a, a place to, to recuperate and nursed her back to health. And they ended up, one thing led to another, and they ended up basically sharing their stories. And, of course, the first thing that she wanted to know is how it, how it happened, how it came about that he pulled her from the burning building once she realised what had happened, the explosion once she came to. And he told her that he was a private mercenary who had been offered a job setting up the bombing at the embassy to blame it on Al-Qaeda, but he hadn't wanted to do it and he pulled out when he found out that there were quite likely to be innocent civilians um, on the casualty list. But because of his conscience, he went to the scene to see if there were any survivors who he could pull out of the rubble, which is exactly what he did with her. And this, this obviously led her to confess to him what she knew about the forthcoming staged event. And of course, he confirmed that that was what was going to take place. And the reason he'd also been asked to take part in the setting up of that event. So this is what she told me. Uh, she also told me about the guy who provided the financial front for the operation of 9-11 and that the front was uh, an Indian tea deal and that that was, the, that was the, the vehicle that they used to provide cover for the channeling of the money to the mercenaries. And it turned out that the guy who saved a life was having trouble with his conscience over being, having been asked to be involved in the 9-11 event, in the staging of it, he decided that he was going to pull out. Because, he, again, for the same reason, once he found out that there were likely to be innocent people killed, he pulled out. And he was very concerned that his life was going to be taken by the organiser, but it turned out that it wasn't because the, the guy, the real architect, the true architect, the one who, who actually laid down the plans of bringing such a such an event to fruition. A man with